Okay, students, we're going to jump to chapter five. And for this lecture, we're only going to cover the esophagus, the stomach, and the small intestines. We're going to leave the colon uh, for the following week uh, and try to keep pace with your positioning class. So the outline of the uh, gastrointestinal system, we're going to cover the physiology of the digestive system, the pathology of the esophagus, stomach, and the small bowel. We're also going to cover in the weeks to come the pathology of the colon, gallbladder disease, liver disease, pathology of the pancreas, and of the spleen. So here are your objectives and your key terms. These are terms you're going to have to know. So going right into it, the uh, physiology of the gastrointestinal system. So the basic function of your GI system is to alter the chemical and physical composition of food so that your body can absorb it and use it uh, as fuel. So it's dependent on the secretions of the endocrine and the exocrine glands and controlled movement of the ingestion uh, food, ingested food through the tract uh, so absorption can occur. So with the esophageal pathology, we're going to talk about transesophageal fistulas, esophagitis, ingestion of corrosive agents, uh, esophageal cancer, esophageal diverticulas. Uh, we're going to talk about esophageal varices, hiatal hernias, achalasia, foreign bodies, and perforation of the esophagus. So the uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, it's just like what it sounds. A fistula is a communication between two parts. So we're talking about the trachea and the esophagus that are communicating. There's the congenital form. Um, this is the form that I've seen most common. Um, it happens when, uh, during development, when the esophageal lumen uh, doesn't completely separate from the trachea. Um, so I'll show you pictures of what that looks like and there's different grades. There's also the acquired type. Um, I've seen this in cancer patients. Um, when they get radiation, uh, there can become a fistula between um, the trachea and the esophagus. Infection, trauma, and instrumentation perforation. Uh, so when they're sticking the tubes down the throat. So here are the different types of fistulas. So here, this is the esophagus proximal, this is distal, here is your trachea with your bifurcation going into your right and left bronchial bronchus. So you have um, an ending here where it failed to communicate the whole esophagus. So here we're not communicating with the trachea, which is really good. This one, we're coming down and we're still communicating with the trachea. So when the person takes a drink of anything, it goes right into the lungs, which um, you'll hear on newborn babies, cough, 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 and they turn blue every time they take a drink. So that's not good. Here um, is the esophagus. And then you can see here that the distal esophagus is communicating with the trachea. So any kind of gastric juices is coming up and going into the lungs. So these babies, every time you lay them flat, um, they'll cough, 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 and they get aspiration pneumonia, which is not good because it's very acidic down into the lungs. This fistula here coming down communicates with the trachea and also the distal communicates with the trachea. So um, when they take a drink, and sometimes this distal portion is up real close, um, they'll take a drink and you can see it go into the lungs and down into the stomach. So they'll drink, drink, and then cough, 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 drink, drink, cough, cough, cough. So um, pay attention to that. So here is a, one of the first types of uh, uh, fistula we have. So you can just see that there's a blind pouch. This is a feeding tube coming in and they're injecting contrast because they can't advance the feeding tube. So you can see here that um, this is um, achalasia. So right there, and we have to figure out what kind of fistula this is. Is it communicating with the lungs? Um, is there a distal portion that's still open? And then here you can see that we're, we've got a fistula going into the lungs here on the lateral, so that's not good. This here is from cancer. Um, you can see here uh, coming down the esophagus, you can see the bronchus there and going down the esophagus. So we've got a, a fistula communication between the esophagus and the trachea, which is um, one of the complications of having um, radiation or cancer where it's eaten away. 
So uh, atresia, that's what I meant to say before, not achalasia, this is atresia. So it's a lack of development. So if you hear of atresia at all, you're going to know it's a lack of development of something. So there's uh, colonic atresia and esophageal atresia, are the two most common. So this is the lack of development of the esophageal lumen uh, resulting in a blind pouch. So as you can see here on this one, this resembles atresia, right? So um, they're saying it's a fistula. I believe them. I need to see the AP to see where that's going. All right, so here's your atresia. As you can see, it just ends. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. They got to open that up. Okay, esophagitis. So um, in acute form, esophagitis is most commonly the result of reflux, so GERD. Uh, what is GERD? It's gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's very common. Most people have it. Um, chronic uh, esophagitis may result in strictures or Barrett's esophagus. We're going to talk about Barrett's esophagus a little bit. It's a, it's a cancer that uh, we need to pay attention to, and it's caused from GERD. So it can also be uh, caused by infection, herpes, and candida. So esophagitis, what does it look like? It's best seen with double contrast. Um, it's superficial ulcerations or erosions that appear as streaks or dots. So you got to pay attention and look closely. You need to see it filled with barium and stripped, what we call stripped, where there's just a, mu a lining over the mucosa. Okay, so um, the barium superimposes on the flat mucosa, and you can see these little dots on there, and that's what we're looking for. That's esophagitis. So um, if you do single contrast, the outer borders of the barium filled esophagus are not seen well. So it's kind of hazy, um, serrated appearance with swallow, um, irregular pulsion indicating erosion. So <laughs> there's tertiary contractions and the tertiary contractions push the food down in a rhythmic um, like muscle movement, pushing the food towards the bottom. So um, if you don't see that working well, so it's irregular, it can indicate um, esophagitis. So penetrating ulcers in the distal um, esophagus, of course. Um, we're also looking for a hiatal hernia because whenever there's a hiatal hernia, we're worried about GERD. So hiatal hernia and GERD go hand in hand. So we're also looking for narrowing of the distal esophagus with no mucosal pattern. So if there's no mucosal pattern, it means that there's swelling. And if there's narrowing, that's also indication of swelling, so um, an inflammation of some kind. So this is esophagitis with a large ulcer, and the ulcer is right there, so it's a penetrating ulcer. And you can see here, so here's the diaphragm, and you can see that we have stomach up above the diaphragm, which is a hiatal hernia. So with the hiatal hernia, this patient probably has reflux disease, GERD, and has an ulcer due to that stomach contents burning the distal esophagus. So here, um, there is a, an ulcer and a large hiatal hernia. So this here is the diaphragm, right? So this is the diaphragm. You can see the stomach here with the stomach uh, rugae up here above the diaphragm. So this is a hiatal hernia. This is a large hiatal hernia. And this is a smaller one, so this is, um, you see the narrowing here? You see how thin and skinny? We would watch this and make sure it doesn't open up. It's not just spasm, but if it never opens up, this is a stricture from esophagitis, so this is inflammation. So you can see here, here's the diaphragm, and you can see the stomach, and this you can tell it's the stomach because it has the rugae in here. So you know that this person has GERD, and with the GERD, we have a stricture, so we have inflammation. So a lot of patients complain of burning, uh, chest pain. They'll also um, complain that food gets stuck a lot in their right down by their heart. So that's a good indication. So if someone ingests corrosive agents, it produces an acute inflammatory changes in the esophagus. Um, I've seen someone drink um, bleach, battery acid, um, all kinds of stuff, and it's not pretty. Uh, their superficial penetration of the toxic agents results in only minimal uh, um, ulceration, so deeper penetration of the submucosal and uh, muscular layers cause sloughing and 
uh, destroyed the tissue and deep ulceration. So people that swallow batteries, this is what we're looking for. So it's going to cause um, burns basically in the tissue deep and it can uh, perforate. So uh, candida esophagus, so there's multiple ulcers and nodular plaques produce this uh, grossly irregular contour of shaggy esophagus is what they call it, shaggy. Um, so with this, you can see along the borders, you see how it's fuzzy and there's all these little ulcers and the wall seems a little thick up here and then pretty thin down here. So it's inflamed and irritated, not good. So. Um, this person needs some medication to clean that up. Esophageal cancer. Um, most are squamous cell. Um, most common site is the gas esophageal gastric junction. It's associated with excessive alcohol intake and smoking. So those of you guys that drink and smoke, pay attention. Uh, most people have dysphagia, occurs in late disease, and typically found late, so prognosis is usually not good. They usually ignore the signs and symptoms that something's going on. Typically, typically occurs at the esophageal junction, which we talked about, and it's higher in men than in women. So um, this is what cancer looks like. <coughs> Excuse me, cancer of the esophagus with irregular narrowing ulceration with this extensive segment of the thoracic portion. So you can see here, um, see how it's what I call chewy. So it looks like someone took bites out of this and just kind of took a piece of bread and like tore it open. So it's all rough margins. Rough margins are bad. So anything in the body that has margins that look like this, it's not good. Any kind of smooth margin is a little bit better. So we're not as concerned about smooth margins, but um, this one right here, so as you can see, so like this right here is a notch, it's fine. This is a notch, so these are what we'd call smooth. This right here, see how it's irregular border and it's kind of eaten away? So this is a flat um, plaque-like lesion. So this is a lesion that's just growing along the mucosa. So this is a cancerous lesion here. It's irregular in its borders. This is really irregular. This is a very bad, bad case. All right, so esophageal diverticula. So it's a diverticula is an outpouching, and an esophageal diverticula is an outpouching of esophageal wall. So there's true or traction. So um, we're talking about the layers of the esophageal wall. So false um, pul or pulsion is comprised only of the mucosa and submucosa herniating through the muscle layer, where the true is all the layers. So small diverticula do not retain food typically or secretions and typically they're asymptomatic. Larger diverticula will fill with food or secretions and um, people usually get aspiration pneumonia because it slowly trickles down um, and gets into their lungs. So there's what we call a zinker's diverticula. It oh, arises from, that's an M on the end there, from posterior wall of the upper esophagus, it's usually in the cervical region. Um, there's traction diverticula, so the thoracic portion of the esophagus um, is where they're found. And they're usually opposite of the bifurcation of the trachea in the region of the hilum of the lung. So um, the motor function disturbance and development in response to the pull of the fibrous adhesions after um, infection of the mediastinal nodes. So, People with like lymphoma will have these traction diverticula because of the um, scar tissue within the mediastinum. There's um, epiphrenic diverticulum, and they arise from the distal 10 centimeters of the esophagus. They're due to increased pressure of the failure of the sphincter to relax. So the, the um, cardiac sphincter where the esophagus empties into the stomach doesn't relax and so there's a lot of pressure in that distal esophagus and it gets a little weakening in the wall and then you'll have a diverticulum that forms. So here's a small zinker's diverticulum. You can see right there, a little small outpouching. Like I said, it's usually in the cervical region and it's posterior on the esophagus. So you gotta put them in a lateral position to see it. The traction here, diverticulum, so it's mid thoracic and it's usually at the bifurcation. That's a pretty good sized one. And the uh, epiphrenic is down at the distal. You can see where here's diaphragm. We're getting ready to go into the stomach. Looks like there's a hiatal hernia here, but you can see this diverticulum right there. 
Varices. All right, esophageal varices. So it's dilated veins in the distal esophagus. It's caused by portal hypertension and it's usually from cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, they may rupture and bleed. Um, the imaging appearance is a wavy border, thick folds, which appear as round or oval filling defects. We usually give double contrast as we can see the lining the best. It looks like worms um, in the distal esophagus and barium may obscure varices and may squeeze out the blood of the veins, making it difficult to detect. So it's really important that we see the esophagus filled with barium and stripped with barium so that there's no barium. We just have the lining with um, the double contrast on there, just coating it. And we can see the varices very well that way. Upright and recumbent is best uh, to demonstrate dilated and emptied of these uh, veins. So this is what esophageal varices look like. So you can see here the worms coming down and they'll be all the way around. Um, there's also uh, round and oval filling defects. These are all um, vessels. So you can see coming down. So the, the liver is not able, it's not functioning well enough to drain all the blood. So the blood backs up into uh, around the esophagus and causes these varices. So my uncle, who was an alcoholic, actually died from esophageal varices after having four or five rounds of them rupturing where he'd be in ICU and getting blood transfusions. Um, so this is serious and patients do die from these. My uncle was 49. So hiatal hernia. So it's a protrusion of a portion of the stomach into the thoracic cavity through the esophageal hiatus. Um, in the diet and then in the diaphragm. So causes GERD um, and a vulvalis can occur. A vulvalis is a twisting, a twisting of an organ upon itself. Okay, so um, it can go up and then twist and then cut off the blood supply, which is not good. There's also um, what we call a sliding hiatal hernia where it slides up along the esophagus depending on the pressures within the abdomen and the chest. There's a parasophageal hiatal hernia, which your book does not talk about, but there is a, a parasophageal hiatal hernia. So it's the disruption of the diaphragm and the, where it enters, well, in the diaphragm and the stomach enters through that tear in the diaphragm into the thoracic cavity. So it's more complicated. The whole stomach can go up into the chest, which I've seen, and it's very odd looking. So here is a sliding hiatal hernia. So you can see coming down, here's your esophagus. And then you can see the diaphragm. You can see the stomach sliding all the way up and around on the esophagus. So you can see it right here too on a CT scan. So this is a large sliding hiatal hernia. It's going right up along the esophagus. And you can see here, this is how it works. Here's the diaphragm, here's your opening, here's your um, sphincter, and you can see that the stomach comes up above where it's supposed to be. With a rolling or parasophageal um, hiatal hernia, you can see that the esophagus comes down, and then here's your diaphragm. There'll be a tear in the diaphragm, and it comes up through the diaphragm. So here's a picture. You can see <laughs> how this, this stomach is up into the chest. So it's very odd when you take an x-ray and you can see the gastric contents in where the patient's heart's supposed to be. It throws you off every time. So then you start the upper GI and the barium is in their chest. So um, very common actually, I've seen it quite a bit. It throws you off every time though. All right, achalasia. So you can have achalasia in, um, your esophagus or in your colon. You can have it basically anywhere. It's very common though in the esophagus and in the colon. So um, functional obstruction of the distal esophagus with proximal dilatation. So what happens is the sphincter does not relax. So it gives a rat tail or bird beak appearance. So you can see here this is your esophagus coming down and then this is your sphincter. So here's your diaphragm going into the stomach and you can see it's got like a bird beak so here's the bird upside down and here's the beak right here or rat tails what they call it too so it looks like a rat's tail going down so um, you just have to make sure that that does open uh, when you are doing an esophagram or an upper gi to make sure that there's no pathologies in there sometimes it's just a spasm 
foreign bodies. All right, so sometimes we can see them, sometimes we can't. They're radio opaque. Um, we need contrast to be able to outline it. So usually in the cervical esophagus or just above the level of the thoracic inlet, uh, radiolucent is best seen with the aid of barium. Uh, we need two projections 90 degrees apart. So here's a fishbone. I think this famous picture, everyone's seen it. So here in the uh, cervical portion. Perforation of the esophagus. All right, so um, maybe complications of esophagitis, ulcer, neoplasm, external trauma, or instrumentation. Some perforations may result from severe vomiting. Um, this does happen. So people that get really, really sick and they vomit, 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 they can perforate their esophagus. Um, and it's actually, it's more common than what you think. Um, it can be from coughing or from dietary or alcohol indiscretions. All right. So perforation, what does it look like? So coming down here, we've got a feeding tube in. So you can see that we've got contrast leaking out. So that's not good. Here you can see the thickened wall of the esophagus and there's some air right there and you can see all this is blood. So this is not good. So if you see this with the thickened wall like this and there's some air right in there too that's telling you that there is a rupture. You've got a perforation in your esophagus. All right, rolling into the stomach. So we're gonna talk about gastritis, pyloric stenosis, peptic ulcer disease, cancer of the stomach, lymphoma of the stomach. <clears throat> so gastritis. It is defined as an inflammation of the stomach mucosals caused by alcohol, corrosive agents, or infection. Um, it changes the normal surface pattern of the gastric mucosal. So uh, it's really thickened and pronounced folds. So the ruga folds throughout the stomach get really deep. So this is abnormally deep and pronounced. So um, the folds are usually smoother. So this is gastritis. Pyloric stenosis is also known as infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Um, two muscle layers of the pylorus become hyperplastic and hypertrophic. Causes are thought to be a combination of environmental and hereditary. Um, usually I see it as hereditary. Uh, demonstrates as lengthening of the gastric antrum and pyloric canal and, um, and thickening of the mucosal. So these kids come in and um, they, parents say every time they eat, within five, 10 minutes, they vomit. I say, do they just kind of spit up or do they vomit across the room like the exorcist? And they say, they, it goes across the room. It'll go 10 feet. And I'm like, that's it. So that's always a good indication. Always ask, you know, do they just kind of spit up? Did it kind of dribbles out of their mouth or is it going like three feet? And they say, oh no, it goes across the room. Then you know that this is what we're dealing with. So it causes an instruction, complete or incomplete. Sometimes it's it's a little, little bit of food through. It's preventing food from entering into the duodenum. So you have projectile vomiting. That's what I'm talking about going across the room. And I'm not kidding when I say projectile vomiting, it'll go like four feet. Um, it can be palpated. So it's often described as uh, a mobile hard olive. So you can feel on the baby's stomach and it'll be hard. This is usually like a, I don't know, anywhere from two weeks to... I don't know, one or two years old that I've actually seen and done the study for. And it's best uh, to be seen on ultrasound. Sometimes on ultrasound, the baby's too gassy. And so they'll come to us and we'll be able to tell. And some, some places won't do surgery without having an ultrasound and an upper GI on the baby. All right, so peptic ulcer disease. So peptic ulcer disease is a group of inflammatory processes involving the stomach and the duodenum. It is caused by the action of acids and the enzyme pepsin secreted by the stomach. So its most common location is the lesser curvature. So peptic ulcer disease, lesser curvature. The disease spectrum varies from small and shallow superficial lesions to huge ulcers that can perforate. Um, it's not good. So the complications are hemorrhage, so bleeding, gastric outlet obstruction, and perforation. So PUD, is the most common cause of acute upper gastrointestinal bleeding. So patients that come in that have blood in their stool and we can't figure out where it's at, we'll actually do an upper GI and look for this. Duodenal ulcer is the most common manifestation and um, most 
my majority occur at the duodenal bulb. So we're looking at the lesser curvature in the duodenal bulb. So looking here, this patient has had surgery prior. So there's surgical clips right here. We're coming down and we've got one right there that we're looking at. So lesser curvature there. So this one here is usually found a lesser curvature, is usually benign. Let's see, um, as you can see here, there the folds are coming up into the ulcer. So um, that's, that's what we're looking at there. So you can see that. Here you can see the folds are going up into the circle. So here, so up into a circle, and here you can't see the folds real well. There's a lot of swelling, but here's the circle. And then you can see the gastric folds. And this one, see how flat these are? Um, small uh, slender folds extending to the edge of the crater indicates benign in nature of this ulcer, whereas B, so this one, see how it has the folds going in? This one doesn't have the folds going in and it's real flat. So this is mag um, malignant. So this one isn't good. This is a regular round mass. So see how it looks different between the two? So the radiologist, when he's looking at the stomach, if we see the folds going up into it, we're not as concerned as we are with this one where we can see the rounding, but there's no gastric folds, which means that's tumor all up in there. All right, cancer of the stomach. So um, it's rare in the United States. It's really big in uh, Japan, Chile, and other parts of Eastern Europe. So pain is not an early symptom. So we don't usually catch it early, we catch it late. Um, same with esophageal cancer, colon cancer, any cancer of the intestinal tract we miss because there's no signs or symptoms. So the prognosis is poor. Uh, predisposing risk factors, so we're looking at atrophic uh, gastric mucosa and um, anemia and 10 to 20 years after partial gastrectomy uh, for peptic ulcer disease. So um, if we take out a peptic ulcer, we want to watch that area for years to come to make sure nothing develops in that area. So imaging, it can look like intense fibrosis, thickening, narrowing, and fixation of the stomach wall. So the stomach is locked in place. It's not mobile like it normally is. It has large irregular um, popoloid masses, so um, irregular irregularity and ulceration within the mass. Um, and if it has a stalk on it, it's usually benign. So if it's a polyp and it has a stalk, it's usually benign. But if it's a flat polyp, it's a concern. So here is gastric carcinoma. We have irregular border right here, and you can see the narrowing of the stomach. So this all is cancer. So this cancer, the stomach should be coming out along here, and this is all tumor. So all of this is tumor. And we're looking here, um, this in this area right here, it is not smooth and regular like it is over here. So this is a gastric cancer on the lesser curve. And here, this is a CT scan, axial. All this around here is gastric cancer. So the thickening of the wall there is gastric cancer. All right, lymphoma of the stomach. Um, it's malignancy uh, that we're going to talk about in Chapter 9. Gastric lymphoma um, often is seen as large and bulky uh, papilloid masses, irregular um, and ulcerated, maybe indistinguishable from carcinoma. So um, they'll have to do a biopsy to be able to tell the difference. So here are your summary of findings for your stomach. So you can take a look at these here. I'm not going to go through them because I just went through them. Now we're going to talk about the small bowel pathology. We're going to talk about Crohn's disease, which is also called regional enteritis, small bowel obstruction, um, a, a dynamic ileus, and a susception, and malabsorption. So Crohn's disease or regional enteritis, um, idiopathic chronic inflammatory disorder. It most often involves a terminal ileum, um, but it can get, go through the whole digestive tract. Um, it will attack the large intestine. Um, it is most common in young adults, uh, usually between 20 and 30 is when it hits. Um, but don't quote me on that. It's usually the younger adults, though. Cause is unknown, but stress and emotional upset are frequently related to the onset or relapse of the disease. So um, small bowel obstructions and um, perirectal abscesses are common. 
So what does it look like? It has irregular thickening and distortion of the mucosal folds caused by inflammation and edema. Transverse and longitudinal ulcerations give this cobblestone appearance, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, there's also narrowing that can give a string sign. So it looks kind of like the bird beak, but it's, it's longer and more irregular. When several areas are affected and separated by um, normal areas, it's called skip lesions. So fistulas um, also form in about half of the patients. So, oh, these poor patients are so sick. So this is the cobblestone appearance here. So we have uh, an attack here on this poor patient. So you can see the cobblestone. Uh, this is what we call cobblestone appearance. So that is not good. There's transverse and longitudinal ulcerations. You'll see both, and that's one of the, the indicators. The string sign, so you can see um, string sign. It's like, where are we? Here, so between the two. So there's your string sign. Um, all right. Small bowel obstruction. Um, most often caused by... Uh, adhesions from surgeries, prior surgeries, um, and the second most common is from hernias. So other causes, it can be from gallstone or intersusception or neoplasm or inflammatory strictures and vascular insufficiency. So the appearance on what a small bowel obstruction looks like. You have distended loops of small bowel containing gas and fluid. You do an upright and a lateral decubitus uh, imaging. So you need to see the air fluid uh, form a line. I'll show you what that line looks like. So this is supine. So you can see the bowel gas patterns just kind of all over. You have really thickened, widened um, loops of bowel. And then here, when you do the upright, it's really important that you see these lines. If you see this line, then you know you have layering of the fluid and the air. So this is a small bowel obstruction. So if you can't get the patient upright, I mean completely upright, sitting them up in a gurney all the way, <laughs> then you need to do a lateral decube. So a dynamic ileus is also called a paralytic ileus, and that's usually what you're going to see in clinic is called a paralytic ileus. It occurs uh, more often than mechanical bowel obstruction. It's a common disorder of the intestinal motor activity. So fluid and gas do not progress through um, the bowel, uh, large and small, as it's supposed to. So neural and hormonal and metabolic factors can trigger uh, reflexes that impede the intestinal mobility. It occurs in almost every patient who undergoes abdominal surgery. So you're going to have these dilated loops of bowel um, that are normal. So other causes, peritonitis, medications can cause it. Um, electrolyte or metabolic disorders and even trauma. So we find it when patients lay around a lot. So um, they lose that um, the motor pushing peristalsis of the contents in their abdomen through. So here you can see we have some dilated loops of bowel. Um, there's no dilatation and no point of, of obstruction. So you can just see they're just dilated so stuff isn't moving so you got to get those patients up and you got to get them moving that's why they want them up and walking every day in a susception so in a susception is the telescoping of one part of the intestinal tract into another uh, because of peristalsis so the bowel is always moving and if there's adhesions or something and it catches it's going to bring one part of the bowel inside of the other so it forces the proximal segment of the bowel to move distally within the outer portion. So this is a major cause of obstruction in children. Um, it can cause compromise the vascular supply and produce uh, ischemic necrosis. So what you're going to see is a coiled spring appearance of the barium trap between the interception and the surrounding portions of the bowel. Um, we use an enema, and the book talks about using a barium enema. We never use barium because... Um, well, I shouldn't say never. Half the time, it depended on if, we, if we're if we concerned about them going to surgery or not, because barium, as you know, is a contraindication for surgery. So um, we'd use gastrographin and try to reduce it. So we could reduce it by doing an enema of some sort. So you can see here, um, we have the bowel, the small bowel, and you can see how the one part of the bowel is now snuck 
into the other part of the ballast telescoped within it. So that's what we're talking about. It's telescoping. So if we do retrograde enema, we can push that out. And um, we've been successful doing that quite a bit. But it is something that we'll come in at 3 in the morning and do. Malabsorption disorders. So this refers to a multitude of conditions in which there are defective absorption of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, whatever, in the small bowel. Um, so patients um, have foul-smelling uh, stool, high fat, fat content stools, and um, the imaging parents, they may or may not produce imaging abnormalities. Um, if it does, here's what to look for. So Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So small bowel dilatation with normal folds, or you're going to get a pattern of generalized, irregular, distorted small bowel folds. And this is what it looks like. So you have this um, widened small bowel. So it's, it's bigger than what it's supposed to be, but there's no obstruction. And you can see there's a lot of mucus within it. Um, you can see through and see the mucus. So this is a malabsorption um, disorder of some sort. What kind? It says it's through. Okay, I believe them. I have no idea. So this is another form of malabsorption. So this just looks chewy, gooey. You have areas of dilated bowel loops. You have areas where it just looks thickened and irritated and angry. Um, this bowel is a sick, sick bowel. Okay, so um, whatever's happening with this person, we need to fix. This is just dilated loops of bowel um, with mucosal. It doesn't look as angry as this one. So this one, you can see the thickened and the strictures within it. <clears throat> Here is your summary of the small bowel. You guys can read this, help you with your quiz. <clears throat> all right, that's all.